Good morning to everybody. Let me invite you to uh, find a seat and direct your attention, please, to the screen. One day when I was out of school for the summer, I saw some boots on the shelf way up high in my dad's closet. I got the ladder like I wasn't supposed to and climbed up to get them. I wondered why they were so dusty. So I carried them to my dad and told him I found his old boots. I asked him why he never wore them. He didn't answer me. He took me outside on the porch and we sat on the steps. I just knew I was in trouble. He placed the boots one step below us and told me they belonged to my uncle Brian and that he died before I was born, so I never met him. Dad picked up one of the boots and dusted it off a little and then said to me, those boots, he used them when he fought in the war. I didn't know what war he was talking about. So I picked up the other boot and dusted it off like he was doing. I told him that I had never been in a war. He just smiled. Then he said, that's why he did it, son. So you wouldn't have to. So tomorrow as a nation, we recognize Memorial Day. Memorial Day is the day that we remember the fallen, the men and women who throughout the history of our country died in the service of our country, that we might be able to do exactly what we're doing this morning, living in freedom. I've pastored a lot of people in over 45 years. I've known people that lost family members in Europe, in the Pacific, against Japan, in Korea, in Vietnam, in the Gulf Wars, and I'm very grateful for the memory of those who more than self, their country loved. Amen? Let's pray this morning. Heavenly Father, as we get ready to begin our worship with singing worship and praise to you, we're so thankful that as a people we live in a country where we are free. We can go from state to state without papers. We don't have checkpoints. We can let our opinions be known about our government and about what they're doing without fear of reprisal, persecution. God, I want to thank you for the freedom that we have, and I specifically want to thank you for the memory since the founding of our country of those who sacrificially gave their lives that we might be able to have our children, our grandchildren, our families, our freedom, and be able to worship like we are today. And for family members throughout our country that are gathered today that have the memory of fallen loved ones, we pray your Holy Spirit would be especially close to them and comfort them and let them feel the warmth and pride of knowing that while they've lost that loved one, their loved one paid the ultimate price for us to live in freedom. May we never discount or take for granted our freedom. We offer this service to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. His love endures forever. Amen. Amen. Let's stand. One, two, three. Give thanks to the Lord, our God and King. His love endures forever. For he is good. He is above all things. His love endures forever. Sing praise. Sing. An outstretched arm, his love endures forever. For the life that's been reborn, his love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever, God is. setting sun his love endures forever and by the grace of god we will carry on 
His love endures forever. Sing praise, sing praise, sing praise, sing praise. Forever God is faithful, forever God is strong, forever God is with us. It's a real simple song, word-wise. Just give all the glory to the Lord as we remember the fallen and we celebrate our freedom for those and, thank, and be thankful for those that gave their lives. We also can be thankful for what God has brought us through. Amen.
he's worthy, give him a hand. Amen. You can be seated. My name is Rick Shirouse, newest addition to the leadership team here. And it's an honor for me to be here this morning to welcome you, family and guests. And now I want you to welcome Pastor Danny. He has an exciting announcement to share with us. I have this. So thank you, Rick. Happy to have Rick on board here. So as uh, I shared with you last week, when we went into 2023, the church had voted to have an amount of money to give to an associate pastor per week. So what uh, we're doing is, in concert with the personnel team, is we're inviting several people to fit within that monetary parameters to fulfill, fulfill different positions, and Rick Shurouse is one of those. Thomas, if you'd come up here. Thomas and Becca got married last July 2nd, correct? Is that right? am, I, am I right, Thomas? You got married on the 2nd of July, right? They moved to Orlando right down at the end of this street, and the very next day they visited the church here. And they've been coming ever since, and they're going to come be a part of us today. But uh, Thomas and Becca feel like God's leading them in their lives to be career missionaries in some, you might say, underprivileged country. He's right now in his Master's of Science degree, and uh, his goal, he's already taken the MCAT last week. His goal is to be a medical doctor and to serve on the foreign mission field at some point. I've gotten to know Thomas real well. Um, I believe he's among the finest young men I've ever known. I know his character. I know how he thinks and all of that, and I believe in him. And I've asked Thomas, he's only going to be here for another 13, 14 months, but I've asked Thomas to invest his life part of the time that he has in trying to connect with teenagers and begin to establish a youth program. So that's what Thomas is going to do. Would you give a great big welcome to him this morning, please, together? His wife, Becca. Do you mind just briefly standing, Becca? That's his wife, Becca. Becca is going to be volunteering to be a part of Yes, there we go. <laughs> Becca's one of eight different people, along with Debbie Dawes, our new children's ministry director, that's going to begin doing children's church. Probably in July it will begin. And so we thank God for these people. Bless you, brother. Look forward to all God's going to do through your life. All right. Do you want to say anything? You're welcome to say anything. Where's the microphone here? You want to say anything? Instant in season and out of season, right? There we go. So. Well, I just want to say thank you to Pastor Danny. He's been such an encouragement to me over these uh, last, well, quite a few months at this point. Um, and I'm just so thankful for the time he's taken to really pour into me. Um, and I'm just honored to be a part of this church and, and watch it grow um, and just get to connect with the youth in the area. I'm just really excited. So Wonderful. Thanks, Thomas, very much. Amen. All right. Happy birthday, church. Today's Pentecost Sunday. The day the church was birthed in Acts chapter 2. I want to read a couple of verses to you. At the end of the chapter, it says, The promises for you and your children and for all of you who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. With many other words, he warned them, he pleaded with them, Save yourselves from this corrupt generation. Those who accepted the message that day were baptized, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. Not bad. One sermon, 3,000 additions. We don't have 3,000 yet, but I believe we can. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you so much that because of the love of Jesus and the love of people who share Jesus with each of us, we're here today, 2,000 years later, not just remembering, but celebrating, celebrating the fact that we know Jesus that we have Jesus in our heart and that we have the greatest message to share with the rest of the world who so desperately needs it. Lord, we pray for the rest of our service. Thank you for our worship team, their preparation, their talent, and your anointing upon them. Use them, Lord, to unlock our hearts. And we pray for our pastor, Lord, that your mercy and grace through him as it flows today as he preaches your word would harvest our hearts for you. And we pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Now stand and greet someone and say, Happy birthday, believer.
great day. What a great day. Birth of a church, new members, new leadership. God is working, amen? Amen. No, you're the man. Let's find our seats as we prepare our hearts and open our eyes. Let's sing. One, two, ready. And open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's sing that again. Come on. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. Do you want to see him? I want to see you. Come on. To see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. To see you high and lifted up. Come on. Shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. Two, three. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. Come on. I want to see you. Do you want to see him? I want to see you. Sing that again. Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Come on. To see you high and lift. Shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, 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 to see you high and lifted up, shining in the light of your glory, pour out your power and love as we sing holy, holy, holy. of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart. I want to see you. I want to see you. Let's sing that holy, holy. Here we go. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy, holy. Holy, holy. holy. Oh. 
behold the man upon a cross I see upon his shoulders ashamed I hear my mocking voice call out among the scoffers it was my sin that held him until it was accomplished his dying breath has brought me life i know that it is finished amen i will not boast in should I gain from his reward? I cannot give an answer, but this I know with all my heart. His wounds have paid my ransom, but this I know with all wounds have paid my seated. The passage we're looking at today in the book of Philippians chapter 2 verses 5 through 11 in my personal estimation may be one of the greatest series of verses in all of the word of God. We're in a series in Philippians called finding joy wherever you are. The apostle Paul is writing to his people at the church in Philippi while he's incarcerated He's locked in a dismal dungeon, chained to a very elite guard for the fear that he might escape and continue to do what he was in jail for, preaching the gospel of his Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And so today we're talking about the subject, our greatest example. Last Sunday we talked about overcoming the cause of relationship problems. And I made the statement last week that perhaps the worst thing going on in the world today is selfishness. You say, well, what about war and what about murder and what about rape and what all these other things? All of those find their root causes in selfishness. Somebody identifying something and saying, I'm going to have that regardless of what it costs the other person 
for me to obtain that. That's what war does. When one tyrannical dictator leader of one country decides that his borders are not enough, so he leads his armies and his air forces to go in and invade another country. It's all about selfishness. It's all about, I'm going to get what I want. It doesn't matter what it costs anyone else. That's what rape does. That's what any kind of problem is all rooted in selfishness. It's all about me, myself, and I. And so last week we talked about the, the right motives for unity among people, and we talked about it says that because we have been united with Christ in verse 1 and because we have comfort in his love and com common sharing in the spirit and tenderness and compassion, Paul says, make my joy complete. And then we talked about how there are four essentials of unity in the last part of verse 2. There's being like-minded, having the same love, being one in spirit, and being one in mind. And then we talked about the way to that unity, that way to have that oneness. Where Paul said, do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. But in humility, humility, value others better than yourselves. Not looking to your own interests, but each of you to the interests of others. And someone's going to say, but Danny, that's so hard to obtain. And I would say, you are exactly right. It's not easy. On Friday morning, I was at a doctor's office for a visit. It was uh, in many ways unpleasant, but that's all I will say. And uh, at one point when the lady came in to take my blood, she said, well, I note that you're married. She said, how long have you been married? I said, well, March 19th made 47 years. She goes, wow. She said, so what will you say to a person like me? I'm 32 years old. I'm thinking about getting married. And she says, what would you say is the key to that? Well, I thought, there's the open door. Let's just open the door wide so I can just drive right in. And so it's interesting you should ask that question because just this past Sunday in the church where I'm the pastor, I talked about this. I said, first of all, Jesus said that we should treat one another like we want that other person to treat us, right? Amen. Now, just that one thing would solve almost all the problems in the world. But I said, one of the, one of the things that I say in every single marriage ceremony that I perform are found in these words, in humility... Value others above yourselves. Esteem the other more person more highly than you esteem yourself. So that the focus of your life is other-centered, not self-centered. Follow me? And then I said, that, then it went on to say, and you know, not only should I look out after my own interests, because we all look out after ourselves, don't we? I said, it says we should make sure that we look out after the interest of the other person and I said honestly I said I've not always done that in 47 plus years but I do believe it's one of the essential keys for unity among people whether it's married couples whether it's family members whether it's friendships or other kinds of interpersonal relationships it's one of the keys that we that we esteem the other person we value the other person above how we value ourselves we don't just look out after our own interests we look out after the interests of others and you know, of course, I wasn't preaching it when I was saying it, like I'm doing now, but I mean, she says, well, I've, I've never heard that before. I've never, ever heard those words before. So I invite her to church. Why not? <laughs> so you say, well, Danny, this is um, not easy. And I would say, right. So what Paul does is he gives us an example. So that's why I've called the message the greatest example, because the example that he gives us is, of course, our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, in your notes, I made two lists of columns because we know the first Adam, when God created Adam and Eve, Adam failed. Adam and Eve chose, after being given the greatest offer, perhaps anybody outside of salvation be given, when God said, everything is yours, all the birds, the fish, the land, the animals, everything's yours except the fruit off one tree in the garden, and if you eat the fruit off that tree, you'll die. Then, of course, Satan comes along the way and says, oh, you will surely not die because God never tells you the truth. He's a liar. He always misleads you. He does not tell the truth, which is exactly what Satan's doing in our day and time by trying to convince people that this is not truth. Name a subject the Bible talks about, and society will tell us, no, that's not truth. But this is truth. And the truth, Jesus said, will set us free. And then, of course, the Bible refers to Jesus Christ as 
the last Adam or the second Adam. So let's look at the columns I put in your notes this morning. When we talk about the first Adam, he was a man created by God. God created Adam. The last Adam was God who created man. Jesus was God. He and the Father were one, so he created man. The second thing about the first Adam, he was made in the image of God. The second Adam, Jesus Christ, came in the likeness of man. So Jesus was God incarnate, which means he was God in the flesh. So when Jesus was born of a virgin called Mary in the little place of Bethlehem and he came into this world, he was God incarnate. He was God who took on the form of human flesh. So he grew up to be a human man. He got hungry, he got tired, he was tempted, he went through all the emotions that we go through, and yet he never sinned, but he came in the likeness of man. The first Adam says he, he, he found his dependence, independence, he sought, it should be the word sought, sought independence from God. He said, I want to do my own thing, but the last Adam, Jesus, submitted to dependence on man. The first Adam exalted himself, we tend to exalt ourselves the, the, the second Adam, Jesus, humbled himself. There's a distinct difference between the first Adam and the second Adam. The first Adam brought death into mankind by sinning in the garden. Death entered into the world. It was never intended for us to have sin and suffering and death, but death came into the world. The second Adam, Jesus, brought eternal life to mankind. Praise his name. The first Adam shifted blame belonging to himself. Remember what Adam said? Oh, you know the woman you gave me, she made me do it. And the blame game has been taking, ever since, taking place ever since then. But what did the second Adam do? He took blame belonging to others. He took our sin on himself. The first Adam was disobedient to the point of death. Look, look, look with me. Jesus, the second Adam, was obedient to the point of death. It's incredible incredible to me. So you can go down the list on the left side where it says the first Adam and you can put your own name. Danny was a man created by God. John was made in the image of God. Barry sought independence from God. Cookie exalted herself. Debbie brought death into mankind and on and on. You can take and you can put names in because that's where we are as human beings who were born with sinful natures, but Jesus Christ came to change that. And so by emptying himself to make void of no effect, of no reputation, how? Look what it says in verse 5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. So now we're going to look at the great example Jesus as to how we do those things that he talked about in the first four verses. Paul says, here we're going to talk about the greatest example of all because we all need examples. The reason why I had no hesitation whatsoever, and it was overwhelming in my spirit to ask Thomas to connect with teenagers, is because I would not have any hesitation whatsoever to put any teenagers in Thomas's presence or worry or concern myself at all what he said to them or what he taught them because I know the man. We all need examples. Sports players need examples. Kids in school need examples. All of us need examples of some kind. As Christ followers, we need an example, and his name is Jesus Christ. So it says, have the same mindset as Jesus. In my study, I found that in 1997, a La Jolla scientist transplanted brain parts from a quail into a two-day-old chicken embryo. And when that chicken embryo began to grow up, it did not sound like a chicken. It sounded like a quail. Imagine that. I like eating both, by the way. Wish I could raise quail, but my wife won't let me. Anyway, it's just one of those things that I don't get my way about, praise Jesus. But Paul tells us to have the same mindset as Christ because, in other words, What's in our minds tends to affect how we live our lives. 
And, 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 and the word of God, the word heart and mind kind of interchangeable, which is why Proverbs 4.23 says that we should guard our hearts because everything we do come from what's in our hearts or our minds, how we think. Jesus said, as a man thinks, what? So is he. And so Paul says, have the same mindset as Jesus Christ. Look at verse 6. Who being in the very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. So here was Jesus born into the world, the Son of God, one of the triune Godhead, equal with the Father God. He could have done anything he wanted to do. But what he wanted to do was to redeem mankind. And so he did not consider going around saying, you know what, I'm equal with God, I'm powerful, I'm omnipotent, omniscient, I'm omnipresent. I mean, no, he did not consider that equality with God something to be taken to his own advantage. In Isaiah 14, we find that Satan was one who regarded the Godhead as a plunderer's prize to his own ruin when Satan, as one of the heavenly created beings, rebelled against God and said, I'm not going to follow you, I'm going to do it my way. And of course, God cast Satan out of heaven And lo, his doom is sure, as Martin Luther wrote in that well-known hymn, A Mighty Fortress is Our God. And he, in the guise of a serpent, in Genesis chapter 3, lured Eve into trying to grasp the same prize, only to her own eventual ruin by death. But Jesus did not come to use his position to an advantage Look what it says as it continues. It says, rather he made himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant being made in human likeness. Folks, I just just want to tell you, there were parts of me this past week or week and a half that almost found it so difficult to try and put some of these things into words on paper because it's like, This is incredible that our Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of God, chose to make himself nothing. He emptied himself by taking the very nature of a servant, not as king, not as master, not as Lord, but he took on the posture of a servant being made in human likeness. Perhaps one of the greatest physical manifestations of that is found in John's Gospel, chapter 13. When our Lord Jesus is seated at the table, the master and Lord of the disciples, girded with a towel and washing the dirty feet of his disciples. Are you kidding me? It was common in that day as you would travel throughout the countryside when you go to somebody's home, if they had a servant... You would get to that place and the servant would be the one that would get down on his or her knees and would take the towel and they would wash the feet of the guest so the guest did not bring the dirt into the home. Here we have the Son of God who chose to empty himself and make himself nothing and take on the form of a servant who got down, took off his outer garment and washed the feet of his disciples. He was just as much God while on earth in his humiliation as he was before he came and before he is now. It's incredible to me. He's our greatest example. I mean, do you ever sometimes just think, you know, quite honestly, I'm just better than that person? Now, how do I say this? Have you, ever met, have you ever met somebody who just doesn't have much common sense? I mean, it's just like, can you not just put it together? I mean, you just, it, it, it's, if we're not careful, it's easy to be tempted to feel like we're just a little bit superior than that person there. I mean, I'm just being honest. This has nothing to do with color of skin or race or language or anything. It's just, we feel like we've got our act together and we can do a good job. And the other person next to us, why can't they get their act together? You know, I mean, gee whiz. But look at the, look what's on the slide and look what's in your note referring to Jesus. He made himself nothing or emptied himself in order to make us everything he wanted us to be. God knew what he wanted us to be. Jesus knew what he wanted us to be. 
as he called us to himself to be his followers, to have a vibrant, eternal relationship with him. He chose to make himself nothing in order to make you and me, us, everything he wants us to be. That's why it says, being found in appearance as a man. For me, it's very comforting to think about Jesus as a man, God incarnate, who understood what it was like to walk the earth as a man. If we were only here today to gather together to worship somebody that never came to earth, that no man has ever seen, I mean, it, I think it'd be a little bit frustrating. But God knew what he was doing. He sent himself, he sent Jesus to earth to walk among us to be the supreme example for us. And the second slide you can write down says this, Jesus Christ became like us in order that we might be like him. He became like us that we might be like him. And then here's the next phrase in verse 8. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. I mean, you know, we have Veterans Day in, in November and we have Memorial Day in May. And Veterans Day, we honor those who served in the military who are living among us. Memorial Day for me takes on much more of a somber note. We think about those who willingly gave their lives in service, that we don't live under the swastika, we don't live under the rising sun, we don't live under the flag of a nation, we live under the red, white, and blue, the 50 stars and 13 stripes, right? Because they sacrificially gave their lives for us. I mean, it's incredible to me. It's even more incredible to me that one of the Godhead, the Son of God, came to earth, he made himself nothing, and because of his great love for you and me and not wanting us to die and face judgment and go to hell, he knew what was necessary for us to have our sins forgiven and have eternal life. And so he became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Someone has written this. Listen to it. The horrors of death by crucifixion began with stabbing pain when nails were driven through his hands and feet. And a sickening jolt when the cross was hauled upright and dropped into its socket so that the whole weight of the body tore through the stab wounds. Then dizziness, cramps, raging thirst, starvation, sleeplessness all added their torments. Gangrene, tetanus, and fever followed in the heat of the sun and torment of flies contributed to the suffering. The unnatural position resulted in cramps, the crushed tendons throbbed, and the arteries swelled. Every movement caused agony, and the anguish gradually increased. For a strong man, death might not come for three days. The physical torture alone was terrible, but there was also something about the public shame of hanging naked and exposed. That was common. Crucifixion was the way of execution in that day. But listen to me, for Jesus there was more. Our Lord and Savior Jesus, the glorious one, was mocked by those he had come to save. And worst of all, he who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. And then would come that awful cry when Jesus was suspended on the cross. And he would say, my God, my God. Why have you forsaken me? Because in that moment, God could not look on sin. Because as Isaiah 53, 6, we all like sheep have gone astray. We've turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord laid on him the sin and iniquity of us all. He who knew no sin became sin for us. All of our sin was placed on Jesus. And when he died, he didn't just die the physical death of crucifixion. He died suffering the punishment that every human being for all mankind in all time should experience. Verse 9, Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name which is above 
every name. There is no name like Jesus. Amen. A couple weeks ago we sang that song, There is a name I love to hear. Remember that? I love to sing its worth. Sing it with me. It sounds like music in mine ear. The sweetest name on earth. Oh, how I love Jesus. 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 Because he first loved me. It's incredible. It's just incredible. And we can't get along with people. And we walk away from relationships because we're so filled with ourselves because we can't have it our way. Many times we just choose to walk away. And homes are divided, families are divided, relationships are divided, churches become divided. Pastor Rick said this morning, this is the day of Pentecost around the Christendom around the world, celebrated as the day of Pentecost. Acts chapter 2 says the church was born on Pentecost. An incredible beginning. And when you read Acts chapter 2, starting with verse 1, what does it say? They were all together. They were all in one accord. They were all gathered together not to be about themselves about the one who gave his life for them and because of that spiritual dynamic that they were all willing to be emptied of themselves and all gathered to worship Jesus and all be in one accord, all of a sudden the Spirit of God fell in an incredible way when the church was born and Peter preached and 3,000 people came to saving faith in Jesus Christ. And our minds have in the past... The unfortunate incidents is where there were fights and bickerings and church splits and people leaving over such dumb, irrelevant subjects as changing the stage or painting a wall a certain color or moving a Sunday school class. Big whoopee deal. None of it which matters to the eternal purposes of Almighty God. And here the Son of God came to empty himself of himself. And humbled himself and took on the form of a servant. And willingly, sacrificially laid down his life and went through all the torment that you and I might have life. It's incredible. Verse 10, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. It's interesting, someday all those who've gone to heaven, someday all those on earth, and yes, even those under the earth. The founders of the world's religions, those who spawned devilish doctrines, those who dyed the earth with the blood of innocent people, those would-be tyrants like Hitler and Stalin and Mussolini and Fidel Castro and Mao Zedong and on and on and on it goes. Every person who's ever lived, whatever their belief was while they were alive, every single human being will one day bend the knee and they will say, Jesus Christ is Lord. Verse 11, and every tongue knowledge confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. You talk about an example worth following. One thing I've always said in preaching when I talk to parents, you know, Proverbs 22, 6 says, train up a child when they should go and they're old, they won't depart from it. Absolutely one of the, the most offensive and worst things a parent can ever say to a child. It's, it's, it's a worst thing. It's offensive. It builds within the, ch the child a root of rebellion for a parent to say, do as I say do, not as I do. If I want good behavior in the part of a child I'm raising, then I should model that behavior. Can somebody say yes? Amen. I mean, how hypocritical it is for me to act one way and expect my child to act another and what did Jesus do? He didn't just tell us, oh, empty yourself and be sacrificial and, and think about others more than you think about yourselves and esteem the other more highly than you esteem. He didn't just tell us that. He was the greatest example of all time. The Son of God 
came from earth, came from heaven, went to earth, and he modeled it for us. Praise his name. The day will come when all created intelligences will have to agree with God that what he has done in exalting his son to the highest pinnacle of power is correct. That what he has done in providing redemption for all mankind through his shed blood of his son is a marvelous exhibition of his immeasurable wisdom, love, and grace. And that what he has done in executing his wrath on all those who've ever rebelled against his throne or spurred his grace is an example of proper justice. God gave us Jesus to follow. And if you're going to have great relationships in your life, and you're going to have the best marriage you can have or the best family relationships you can have or the best friendships you have or the greatest solid church that the Spirit of God can use to do great things in and through, then we're going to look to Jesus, our greatest example, who emptied himself, who made himself nothing. And if we follow that example, it'll be just somewhat easier to say, you know what? I don't just look after my own interest. <laughs> I look after the, after the interest of others. And when I see you, I esteem you and value you more highly than I esteem or value myself. Think what a tremendous spiritual dynamic and gathering of love that makes among the people of God. Let's pray. Every head bowed, every eye closed in prayer. I'm so thankful to God. He didn't just write words to tell us how to live, he gave us an example in human flesh that we might follow. Father God in heaven, if we're all honest this morning with ourselves, if we're all honest and vulnerable as we come to you in prayer, it's just not easy. It's not easy to not want our own way. It's not easy to empty ourselves of ourselves. It's easy to be demanding and have expectations that are sometimes unreasonable of others. And yet, God, if we were also honest, we don't like the end results of being like that. We don't like the hard feelings. We don't like estrangement in relationships. We don't like to see people leave church or churches split. God, we, we all in the depths of our hearts want unity and love to abound in our individual lives, in our marriages, in our, in our families. And God, since we're believers gathered together in a church building this morning, we certainly want that among our church. Because God, we're not here for ourselves. We're here to bring glory and praise and honor to you, and we're here that you might use us to say a word about you others. God, I want to thank you that as simple as it was when that nurse who took my blood said, so what would you say is a key to staying married so long? You just opened the door. God, I believe you're going to open doors lots of places for us. So God, may your spirit fall upon our church in such a way that we might be known as a place that, of people that just care about each other more than we care about our own selves. Where love abounds. Thank you for the example you've given us. Help us to make application in our lives, not just this morning at this moment sitting in church building, but in the coming days and weeks when it gets challenging. We confess we cannot do it ourselves. Dear Jesus, we desperately need your power and strength to follow your example. We pray this in your name. Stand and sing.
There's a little chorus, it's an old chorus, it's a simple chorus, and it goes like this. He is Lord, He is Lord. He is risen from the dead, and He is Lord. Every knee will bow, every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Let's sing it together. He is Lord, He is Lord, He is risen from the dead and he is Lord every knee shall bow every tongue confess that Jesus Christ if you're here this morning and you personally have never had a time when you've entered into a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, then most likely that's what the Spirit of God is talking to you about right now. Wanting you to say, Lord Jesus, please forgive my sin. I want you to be my personal Lord and Savior, so I invite you to come into my heart. I want to be in relationship with you forever and ever. Thank you for what you did for me. We're going to continue singing these choruses, and I'm going to be standing down here at the front. If that's your desire, I'd love to lead you in a prayer that will introduce you to relationship with God. If you want to be a part of our church, for those of you who are guests this morning, particularly those with little children, we're in the process of rebuilding. I've now been here, the head pastor, for three months. We're excited because we've got children's ministry director, and just in the coming weeks, we'll have programs and a way to take care of the little children. We look forward to that. But if God wants you to be a part of our church, you step out and come and meet me at the front this morning. Whatever God says for you to do, let's do it right now. Let's sing it together. He is Lord. He is Lord.
time. Sing it out. Here we go. He is Lord. He is Lord. He is risen from the dead. And he is Lord. Every knee shall bow. Every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Thank you. Be seated, please. We're going to take the offering right now. For our guests, we don't expect you to give. If you want to, that's fine, but there's no expectation on our parts. For the rest of us, on whatever increment we get paid, we give offerings to the Lord. If you have a Connect card or prayer request to put in, you can put in the offering plate right now. And here's what I want us to do to close the service this morning. Dan, please, I want us to pick up on that song about death could not hold you, and that's how we're going to end the service this morning, all right? All right. You know what? Before we do that part, I want you to strike an F chord while they're taking the offering. I want you to sing with me, God bless America. Here we go. God bless America. Land that I love. Land that I love. Stand beside her. Stand beside her and guide her. And guide her through the night with the light from above. From the mountains to the prairies. To the oceans white with fog. God bless America, my home, sweet home. God bless America. Now you guys can find your D chord again. And I want us to pick up, and before we go, sing one more time. Have a great week. Death cannot hold you. Let's end on this greatest thought this morning about our great example. Here we go. Death could not hold you. They'll turn before you. Silence the ghost of sin. Have a great week, everybody.